Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome uh, to our Distinguished Alumni Series, where we reach out uh, to our alumni who are global leaders uh, to learn more about how to navigate the present uh, crisis. And I'm delighted uh, today to welcome Ellen Kuhlman, who is a longtime friend of Kellogg and is also right now a trustee of Northwestern University. Now, Ellen is the president and CEO of uh, Carbon, uh, the world's leading digital manufacturing platform. And uh, before was the chairman and CEO of DuPont, where she was the first woman to lead DuPont in 212 year history. So really, uh, you know, going from a large organization, being the first woman to a smaller private company, but in high tech and high growth. So. I always tell alumni how Kellogg prepare um, people for multiple careers, and I think that she is the perfect example of that, of how, you know, people have to learn to be versatile and, uh, and follow passions in different areas. She's been named uh, 50 most, one of the 50 most powerful women in business by Fortune, world's most powerful women by Forbes. Uh, I met Ellen uh, very early on when I had joined just the beginning of my tenure as a dean and I was very grateful to, for how she reached out to me as a woman to support another woman leading an organization showing you know that's always it's an incredible network of support. So uh, welcome uh, Ellen, uh, thank you for coming for this, uh, for this talk. Um, uh, let me, I, I just want to start, let me start from the part in, in DuPont in particular, because actually in the last one we had talked, uh, in the last uh, series, uh, event we had, we talked about multiple crises and how this and what we learn from different crises. And when you were at DuPont, you really were in, during the period of the financial crisis, right? So, so what is interesting with us is, uh, you know, what is it that you learned during the financial crisis that helped you to steer carbon today? Very yeah. different organization, but is there a thread? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, there's always, a, always seems to be a crisis um, that comes and goes. Now, the global financial crisis in 08, I was just named the company's president and CEO the weekend before Lehman weekend. And global markets were falling, uh, industrial markets were in free fall. Um, and there are a couple of things I learned from that experience. Number one is you need to focus the organization on what you can control. And we couldn't control the markets, but we could control our spending, we could control our plants and what we did with them, we could control how, you know, are we going to continue to spend on R&D and innovate during this, uh, this very troubled time. And so one of the key learnings I had was if you have a large organization or a small organization, settling them down and helping them focus on what they can control is really an important first step in navigating that crisis. That very important. Uh, by the way, I should mention that if you want to start putting in a Q&A and then I can come back and bring in. So, you, you can start putting in questions now if you want. Now, following on that, right? Right now, we are also in a crisis where uh, we are all uh, trying to react to the short-term emergencies. But at the same time, we start thinking, you know, what is the afterwards? How are you doing? So during the financial crisis, what, how did you go about? What did you discover? that would make you less focus on the short term and, and more also on the long term. Yeah, you know, it was interesting because we were um, very much uh, having the realization that the markets weren't going to return to what they were before, that the world was fundamentally changing, that people were going to um, view things very differently, you know, cash allocations, investment returns, how they think about these things. And so one of the things we did was realize that we had to simplify ourselves and simplify our organizations, consolidating businesses, focusing on the ones that had more opportunity coming out of the economic crisis back then, and create a, a different trajectory than what we had thought coming through the middle of 2008. So one of the key learnings was that whatever you thought your plan was, 
before the crisis is probably not going to be your plan after the crisis. And you really need to get the team focused on creating a new trajectory and really understanding how the markets are changing, what the impacts are going to be on your customers and hence you, and then how do you chart that course very effectively. For us, it was continuing our investment in research and development, new products, innovation. It gave our people something to talk to customers about, except how bad things were out there. So we could talk to them about, hey, you know, if we could do this innovation, what would that mean for you? And, you know, we really helped keep our people engaged and chart a new course as we were coming through that financial crisis. And how would you go about planning the post-crisis operations? I mean, as you were saying, you wanted to simplify, but I would imagine the plan would have been very complex. Thinking of the present crisis, it's very difficult to think exactly what will be the new normal, right? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because, you know, we tried the plan and then we realized that that was kind of uh, ridiculous because it kept changing. So every time we finished a plan, the world was different. So we shortened our timelines. We met more often. Um, we did our supply chains instead of once a month. We were literally doing them weekly. Um, and so our cadence had to change to keep up with the amount of change that was going on in the marketplace. And we had to match, you know, it wasn't about, you know, us waiting a month and deciding what to do because we would have wasted a lot of resource and, um, you know, just, you know, back, back in that day, as it is many day, cash was the, the issue. We wanted to maintain our dividends. Uh, we wanted to pay our people and, um, and, the, and the financial markets were very skittish back then. So we really focused on generating cash. We really focused on those types of things in order to continue to get through. So you've got to really change your pace, uh, your cadence to match what the change is in the world. And then you need to create more flexibility and agility in your teams. And that's a really hard part. You know, people get, they get enamored of their plans. They get enamored of what they, you know, had been working on. And you have to cre create it to be okay for them to open up and to change and to say, that's not going to work anymore. Let's focus and do some different things that are going to work better in this new environment. So you also have to make it okay for people to come in and say, you know, the plan we've been working on just isn't going to be the one we need going forward. You have to enable it. And talking about change, you did a pretty big change joining uh, Carbon. Now, can you talk a bit about what Carbon does, what attracted you? Yeah, so when I, um, when I retired from DuPont, apparently I flunked retirement, um, I was recruited um, by Alan Mulally, gave me a call, said, I really want you to go see this little, co little company. You're a manufacturer. You love manufacturing this company can disrupt manufacturing. And so I did go out and visit. I ended up joining their board, and I've spent the last three years on their board. And Carbon is really taking 3D printing from prototyping into manufacturing. We can do it. It's, it's plastic. We can do it at a scale, at a cost that's relevant. We're printing um, Adidas midsoles. And, you know, we've, so far we've printed close to a million pairs of Adidas midsoles with our production partners. Um, so we make the printers, the software, we have the services, design tools to allow companies to create um, flexibility and agility in their manufacturing process through 3D printing. I'm getting already a question exactly about the transition. It's saying, how did you think through the transition from an ex-CEO of a public company, the board member, to becoming the CEO of a startup. What was the thought process behind that? And what was the single biggest learning from your first few months in a startup? Yeah, so the founder, Joby Simone, is a phenomenal guy. He's a great TED Talk out on carbon. If you, if you Google Carbon 3D, he does a phenomenal TED Talk on the technology. You know, he was, he was great at building the, the real beachheads. What are the proof points for the technology? But he had never worked in a company before. He had never scaled anything. He didn't, the repeatability, the need to establish a, a supply chain, the need to drive efficiencies and really scale um, were things that were, that he did not, had never really done himself. And so literally sitting in board meetings, my, I was lead director being in discussions with him, you know, we, 
thought about, I thought it was kind of a joke at first, the switching roles. And you've done this before. Why don't we, you know, why don't you do it? And I can, you know, go do the strategic stuff. And and um, talking to the other board members about it, you know, to, I'd always said I'd never go back full time unless it was compelling. And, you know, I really think this technology has an opportunity to disrupt um, a, you know, advanced manufacturing in, in a really, really impactful way. And I thought, heck, you know, it's going to be fun for the next couple of years. And that's what I found. Running a, running a private company beats a public company nine times out of ten. It's simpler. <laughs> you know your board members. You can get lined up. Um, you know, you've got, I mean, small team, tremendously dedicated, wonderful people. And so um, to tell you the truth, it's fun. Ah, wow. So actually, I have one more question, which is refer a bit to the DuPont and public versus private. Say, what's more important in a crisis time like this? Maintaining a dividend or maintaining the trajectory of the company, for example, R&D, which is probably an especially important issue for a company like DuPont that values innovation so highly. Yeah, so we were lucky enough back at DuPont where we didn't have to make that choice. We were able to maintain our R&D and pay our dividend, but we did do restructuring and we let go, you know, 10% of our leadership, 8% of our general population during that time. Um, but I can tell you that we, in my focus on my team now is you've, you've got to build your way out of it. It's it's, you really need to be able to engage customers with innovation and what's new. And so, you know, cash cons conservation is great, but not at the expense of being able to grow in 21 or 22 as these markets return, as, you know, life, you know, gets on the upside of that scale. And so um, I'm a big believer that innovation is one of the most important things you can invest in. Um, and I think it's really important to keep that cadence. Okay. And I find one more. How do you find the data that you track to pivot and make new trajectories? I guess that would be true for both of uh, of your. Yeah, I think that literally is teamwork. I think it's having a team that really knows their business, knows the markets. Um, back in the global financial crisis, and even now in the last 10 weeks as we are sheltered in place, we're spending a tremendous amount of time together as a leadership team in different parts of the leadership team, talking through the engineering programs, the marketing programs, and really aligning around what's going to be important. As a matter of fact, most of our marketing, uh, we were in a process of transitioning to digital. Obviously, it's all digital now, right? And we're putting our education programs out there. So it's like, okay, no time like the present. Um, you know, forget the plans that taken nine months to do it. Can you do it in like uh, two weeks? Yeah. And um, and our CMO, Dara Setter, and her team just are phenomenal at, at really pivoting on that and doing a great job. Now, I'm seeing actually questions coming in about the 3D. I have a question. It says, after 30 years, 3D printing is still an emerging solution that haven't yet crossed the shelves into mainstream manufacturing and is very application specific as to what parts make sense to be 3D printed economic wise. Uh, what do you think would it take for it to be adopted more into the mainstream? You know, it's interesting because I think that's right. We've been very successful at things that are, for instance, not moldable, like the lattice um, that, um, that we use in the Adidas midsoles or the liners for the Riddell helmets or even specialized bike seats. It's their lattices. Um, they're not moldable. Um, and the, but the economics of the 3D printing work, and they're, they've been very successful. And so there, that is one area we're focused on, but we're moving into things like electrical connectors, things where instead of holding large um, inventories of things, what about if the design's in the cloud and you can print what you need where you need it? Ultimately, that's the goal. It'll take a while to get there. But I think making sure that designs are moving into the cloud, into the digital world, gives you the flexibility to whether you put it in a plant in Malaysia or in a plant in, in Brazil or a plant in the United States or Europe. You can move that production in 3D printing. There's a lot of flexibility and agility there, which we've seen has been very important uh, during this uh, latest uh, crisis, the COVID crisis. 
and always I, I can see that the, the carbon is attracting a lot of attention. So what are the challenges at carbon to sign up manufacturer to use your platform, especially when it is a, when it is a newer company? So initially, many of the OEMs have signed up at, for a couple of printers to use it in their design process and to test parts, more functional prototyping and things like that. And then there's a network of production partners that we have that their sole job, they do injection molding, they do 3D printing, they use many different technologies to be contract manufacturers for many different companies out there. And so the first step is converting them into our technology or having our technology be part of their arsenal. And we have small ones that just do design. We have uh, you know, great partners like Fast Radius in Chicago who do a lot of 3D printing for customers with our technology. And then there's some very large ones emerging in Asia that are producing these you know, millions of, uh, of midsoles for Adidas and the likes where it really is 3D printing as a factory. Um, and as a massive scale. And so we're working very closely with that production network, as we call them, to really bring that up to a scale with the pre and post processing that are, that's, that's you know, relevant to the kind of applications that we're working on. Fantastic. And see here, what does a typical day look like for you at Carbon? And how do you compare that with what it was like at DuPont? Well, I can tell you the typical day is sitting in front of my video camera uh, today. But before, right <laughs> before we started, yeah, before we started down here, it's very different. I, I have no office. I have no series of doors that are a barrier for people to come and speak to me. I'm in the open area just like everyone else is. And anybody in the company can get up and talk to me. I can go up and talk to anybody in the company. It's very fluid. Um, we can have impromptu meetings. We can get a lot of done just by walking over to somebody's desk and three of us talking through an issue, as opposed to having to schedule a meeting and getting the right people involved and everybody, you know, PowerPoint charts are not what you need. You know, I mean, it's, it's bring what you have. It's simple. It's let's just get together and get it done. So it's a much more informal environment. Um, it, it flows very quickly. And, um, and I just think it feels, you know, it's interesting because, um, you know, the, we always make jokes that I used to have people to do things. Now my people is me, right? <laughs> and um, which is great uh, because I'm now much better at technology than I used to be. Um, but it is, you're part of it, right? And it reminds me very much of the, of like when I was building out the safety and protection business at DuPont, small, great team. Um, doing really interesting things and all in it together. And, and I think that environment is just, um, is just really, really helpful in order to enable that. Yeah, that's great. That, that will be an interesting message for people who are trying to decide the organization. Actually, there's a related here question asking, asking, coming into Carbon as a CEO, starting right at the top, how do you get people to follow you on day one? Well, I had the advantage of being on the board, so I knew the leadership team. And the second thing is, is that I sat down with each one of them individually offsite. Uh, tell me about what you love about the company. Tell me if you were in charge, what you'd change. Um, you know, tell me what you think my priorities should be. Tell me what your priorities are. And it was interesting where there was common ground and where there wasn't common ground. And doing that really enabled me to see where the leadership was aligned and where they weren't. And most importantly, where they weren't really slowed the company down because there was a lot of debate or pocket vetoes or things like that going on. So that really enabled us to, and I'm a very transparent person. I bring people together, we talk about issues. It's, it's not about personality, it's about the company. And, you know, and we're working through those issues and some of them are easy and some of them are a little harder uh, from the standpoint of, you know, three, two years from now, what is the product roadmap? Not today or not in six months, but let's project out. Are we doing the right work to understand where we should be? And, um, and so I do think that understanding where we're not aligned and start to drive that alignment really brings people together and creates trust, um, trust, as us as a team and in me as a leader, which I think is really important to work on as you start into any new role. Yes, and again, they're all related. I guess you're inspiring other questions. So it says, question on leadership and change management at Carbon. 
What is the biggest challenge you're facing in changing the culture and mindset of your team from a startup mindset to that of discipline and scalability? Yeah, you know, I think, yeah, I'm sorry. No, no, I was going to say, it is just the right, that is a, it's difficult to get outside of the startup mentality. You know, it's interesting, because I think the fear when I first came in was I was going to bring a lot of big company process and bureaucracy, and that scared them. And when I came in and did not bring, you know, I said, what are your processes? Let's understand your strategic process, your operational process, your people process. Oh, you don't have one. Okay, so let's start to create one. And I, and I engaged them, you know, and I think they were all looking at me saying, no, just, just tell me what to do. It's like, no, you know the company better than I do. What do you think it should be? And that takes a little longer, but I think that engagement creates buy-in. Um, and it really does. So I do think there's a lot to, to be done in that engagement side. I mean, I was really happy to have um, three months there, you know, in the building before we all got scattered, because it makes it a lot easier to continue to do this work on, on uh, the video conferencing. Yeah. And, and, and so and what's your take on the chances of a broad and fast energy transition given the current crisis and the low prices for fossil fuels. And what is carbon doing to support sustainability business goals and the new Green Deal? Yeah, so, you know, it's, it's the one thing that's been true over the entirety of my career is the volatility of energy. And, you know, there were years when, I mean, and I, I had the businesses that sold the, the products into the solar industry and the wind industry from DuPont, the materials part of it. And we saw it had great growth, and we saw it contract as, as, as these changes occurred. Um, but the only thing that is true is that oil is a set quantity. It might last, you know, their oil industry says we got another 100 years, but it, it has great impacts on us. And so I, I'm a big believer in sustainability, and we've got to create a better future there. And alternative energy is certainly something that we've been promoting um, from a DuPont standpoint. From a carbon standpoint, we're starting to, we're, we're focusing some of our research on, um, you know, reducing the amount of polymer it takes to make a part, to recycling the polymer, to be able to use it post-processing, to recycle it, to be able to use it, um, and then using polymers from sustainable sources. Um, and one from, from a, a, it's actually from a DuPont Tate and Lyle joint venture. Um, that's called Serona. That's in one of our pop, That's in one of our resins that we use to make parts. And it is a big focus of many of our customers. They really want to see us help them become more sustainable. And so we are, we take that seriously. We believe there's a lot we can do. Um, you know, to the reduce, reuse, and recycle um, that standpoint. And we we continue to work on it. Fantastic. And there's one, clearly someone interested, says, have you hired MBAs at your new company? And if so, do you find it easier or harder than a different Why? Yeah, yeah. So um, we actually, I kind of came in in the middle of it and they already had their interns set for the summer, some of which we'll be able to use, others of which, you know, we, we can't. But um, and we're just starting into that process. And so I do think there, there's an opportunity and for, we're going to have an opportunity to bring some in uh, next year. Um, I think the question is how good of a salesperson, you know, can I be or is the company? Um, you know, it's one thing. We, you know, a lot of Kellogg uh, alum last year um, went into San Francisco, into places like Salesforce or into, you know, Google or Apple and things like that. And so I, my, part of my challenge is to introduce you and, and others into the smaller companies that are out here that have tremendous opportunities associated with it to learn, because there's not many of us, right? And so you're right in the midst of it and really doing very, very quickly in a company of like our size, which is 400 plus people. I agree, I agree. Uh, it looks like an incredible learning experience. We will get send you students. Now, I, I have a lot of questions, but I wanted to ask one because I, I'm very interested in the fact that you started using your 3D printing capabilities to make face, face shield for frontline medical workers and nasal swabs for COVID, COVID testing kits. 
And we just, I, the idea is, can you tell us a bit the process? How did you go about quickly creating a new product? When did it become the idea? What were the challenges? Yeah, you know, so on March 16th, they pretty much shut down the Northern California counties and we all went home. And it was, it was only like 48 hours later where um, I got the first phone call from the founder who said that um, he'd been hearing from other 3D printers, what can we do to help? And so we put our design teams um, at work to just open-ended, what can we do? And found very quickly, face shields aren't hard to print. And, you know, we had excess, we had some excess resin, we had um, support from Adidas, and we actually held a webinar, 300 of our production partners, um, and open sourced a design for a face shield, put it out there, talked them through how to do it, um, you know, have it occur locally. We produced some with the support, we produced about, I don't know, 100,000 with the support of Adidas. And we actually donated them to communities in need like the Navajo Nation and other small communities that were really struggling because they didn't have the funds to go buy them. Um, and we created a network for people very, very quickly within a week to start producing face shields. You know, you can get the PET, you know, cut to the right size and stuff like that very easily. So this is the printing the band that goes around the head. And then about a week later, um, we started seeing these needs around swabs. And, and a couple of our uh, designers said we could print those. And they went to work. And we um, started um, creating designs. We started printing them. We partnered with Stanford University and with um, Beth Israel Deaconess in Boston. And, you know, clinically working on them. That's a tougher, uh, a tougher um, product because it has to be comfortable for the patient, it has to actually collect an appropriate sample, and it has to be usable within the PCR equipment that are used to analyze the samples. And so it had a higher technical component associated with it. We partnered with uh, Resolution Medical out of Minneapolis and one of our resin suppliers, Keystone, and um, created an opportunity for our production partners to print these swabs, to have Resolution Medical, um, you know, sterilize them, package them, and start moving them out. So we've had to do some um, clinical trials. So we've done it with those two institutions. University of Colorado is also involved, others. We actually got some data back today that it looks like we may have less false negatives um, with a lattice swab than you do with the historic swabs, which were designed in 1923. So you can mm -hmm. imagine it might be time to think about a new design. Um, but what was what absolutely amazed me and certainly coming from a company like DuPont with global supply chains, you know, very efficient, economies of scale, was how quickly we could pivot to doing the kind of things we were doing, face shields, nasal swabs. I mean, it was not weeks or months, it was hours and days. And our people were very excited to be able to work on something to help. I think everybody was feeling kind of helpless you know, back in mid-March, nobody knew where this was going. Certainly nobody thought we'd still be sitting in our homes in the middle of May. Um, but, uh, but the reality of the situation, people just wanted to help, and they wanted to feel like we were doing something to do that. And it was an easy thing to rally the company around. Um, we decided to pay our, all of our employees anyway, regardless of whether they could do their work from home. Um, and this actually enabled us to put some people in our labs, you know, appropriately through the CDC, with the CDC guidelines to be able to produce these things and to, to work through the design cycles. And I think it's, it's been, it's really showed me the power of the technology. And, and did it have an effect for you, your employees, uh, to produce such life-saving equipment? Do you think that's going to give them a sense of purpose that is going to last even beyond the crisis? You know, I, I think it, it gives them a sense of what the team can do when they work together. And, you know, and it, it was, it's really very heartening to see how people responded very, very positively. And I think it gives them, I think not only does it say, hey, what other medical applications can we do? I think it challenges us to think about our pace of play in the quote unquote normal course of business. 
we were able to do things in in a scant two months that you know I think given normal timelines we might have said six months. So how do we challenge ourselves on the really important things to to create a pace of play that really gets us into the marketplace much more quickly? And I think it's given us all a lot to think about and talk about and to see how we can utilize what we've learned to make us a stronger company. And then there's some question. I think uh, clearly some people are intrigued by your uh, your uh, role in different levels of organization. There's someone, uh, she must be a recent alumna, and she's writing, many of us recent grads are in strategic roles consult slash consulting. What do you recommend to transition to owning a team or P&L at a mid-sized company? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, first of all, really understanding where your passion is in terms of product or in terms of industry or market. Because when you're in a consulting role, many consulting roles are very broad in terms of the industries and areas that they focus on. Um, and so what is your area of passion? I mean, I love, believe it or not, I love industrial companies. I love manufacturing. So, you know, I'm sticking with what I know. I think the other thing is, is you know, how do you get to know these companies? I see a lot of consultants move into small and mid-sized companies because they've had an opportunity to interact with them. And they get to know, you know, the head of marketing, the head of product, and, um, and people see how, wow, these strategic skills could really be helpful to us. Because, you know, I'm, I'm looking at the company now and looking at the amount of strategic skill I have and the amount of operational skill you have. And you have to have both, right? And you can't, you can't load up too much on one and not the other. Um, but there are a lot of great small companies out there. Well, it, not only in, in California, but in, you know, in Boston and Austin and, you know, in Chicago and um and i think that you really need to 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 put your feelers out start talking to people and seeing but i think consulting is a great background to have to start it really lets you see the whole picture and how companies really can be successful and then i think you need to test your skills and um and for me I, where, where i went after i got my mba was into into product management uh, you know, for me, that was a really key um, transition role in from what I was doing before to to getting more into and up through a p and l role. And what's your take on how to think about balancing new growth r and d investments versus existing business investments at a small company with limited resources? Yeah, so um so we're going through this sustaining versus growth like investment and what we need. And it's the first time the company's looked at that because we finally have some business that's large enough to be considered sustaining as opposed to it all being growth. And you know, the interesting thing is, is that um, the organization wants to protect the sustaining business and wants to throw a lot of resources at it. And I'm a believer that sustaining business, unless you're continue to innovate, price goes down, not up. And so sustaining business, although might have great value today, you still have to provide either small amounts of innovation, you know, over time, you know, and or just understand that that's going to erode at a certain rate and you need to be adding to it. I mean, we at the Pont had models for each business and what we thought that erosion was on the sustaining business. And we had capped what we thought the investment should be there. And then we always had that opportunity to what were we adding to it to create the growth that we needed, understanding we had to offset that erosion. But I think that's all, I mean, that's, that's conversations we're having right now at Carbon and understanding what is what support we need to do for the sustaining business and what, to, what we do for growth. That's interesting. Now, a different tack. How does the government trade wars with and others impact your business? Are you impacted by the? Are you impacted about uh, from by the trade wars of the government with China? Oh, certainly. Yeah, absolutely. We have probably over a hundred printers in China. Um, we have um, great uh, customers over there, and are working with other uh, new opportunities over there that are that are quite substantial. Um, you know, we, you know, even though today it feels like there's a lot of nationalism creeping in because of the COVID crisis and people wanting to protect their borders and their countries, you know, I think at some point this is going to, the global supply chains by and large are going to continue to 
a certain extent, right? They have to, right? That's the way they're set up. And I think we need to find that common ground with China. And right now, it's, it is, I think, very tenuous in terms of what's going on, whether it's you know, the U.S., um, you know, and how they think about Hong Kong, uh, versus just general trade and tariffs and things like that. I mean, I think that there's, um, you know, I think we've got to figure out how both countries get this to an acceptable place because it's going to impact uh, the majority of us. And I actually have some because I mentioned you were the first woman. So there's a couple of questions about your role as a Woman, first of all, what advice do you have for women interested in board service? Well, I think first and foremost, board service is um, about knowing what skills you bring to that board and knowing what you want to learn by being part of that board. Like you really need to want to know the industry because you're going to spend a lot of time learning about it and its competitors and what the position of this company is. And so, and the second thing is, what can you bring? You know, what is your expertise and what can you bring? The other thing is, you know, board service or first board service, somebody's going to take a, um, somebody's going to take a chance on you, right? And so what you really need to do is utilize your networks, people that know you, people that know what kind of person you are and how you can, um, what you would really bring to the party. Are you a collaborative uh, player? Are you going to work well within the board environment? And, and you know, right now there's, um, I think people are looking broader than just ex-CEOs and CFOs uh, for board members. They're looking for people who have marketing experience, technology experience, you know, engineering experience, cyber experience is big. And so um, I think there are opportunities there for much, much broader swath of, of the population than historically people have looked at. But I think you've got to be got to be able to sell yourself and tell them what skills you can bring. Yeah. And what advice would you give to women who graduated four or five years from Kellogg and trying to navigate moving into leadership position in high tech? In your journey, what did you find most helpful? Networking, having sponsors, women leaders or mentors. Yeah, I think my experience, what I found was really helpful with sponsors, you know, and it starts as a mentor, um, you know, and I, I had, I had, I had a couple at DuPont and they were very, very helpful to me to bring me to higher levels in the organization. And I mean, and they would hold the mirror up, right? They'd say, hey, this is what you're great at, but you know, you got, you got sharp elbows and you need to tame those, you know, if you're going to get along well in the sandbox, doesn't mean you get rid of your tenacity or your, um, you know, you don't dumb it down, but you really do have to have to, you know, bring it into line a little bit. And these people also became uh, sponsors. They, in the room where decisions were made, they'd say, well, what do you mean? You know, Ellen's got that experience and she's just as qualified as he is. Um, so, you know, why not? I remember when I was the, um, the first woman to be named to a vice president and general manager, which was the P&L at an officer level at DuPont. And, um, and the, the CEO literally came up to me afterwards and said, you know, I'm taking a big risk on you. Um, but here, the, you know, there are a couple people who came to bat for you and I really trust them. And it's like, oh my, now that's like, that's no pressure. Yeah, no pressure. It's okay. <laughs> um, and then the, the market fell in TIO2 and our price tanked, you know, hundreds of dollars a ton. And, um, and you know, I had to work my way out of it. But, you know, I think sponsorship really, um, understanding mentors and creating sponsors out of them is a really important part of it. And uh, actually, there's one more for a board. It says, what are the most important characteristics you look for in a board member in a startup? So, you know, it, startups are different because the board is oversight, but board is also how can you help us? And in, in a much more direct way, like, you know, we were out looking for a financial expert. To, we started an audit committee last year. We were looking for a financial expert. Um, and, you know, and the person we found and the reason we felt so comfortable bringing her on the board was she, um, she was helpful. She wasn't trying to be so exact, oh, you have to do this, this, this. She's like, okay, let's think about what you need on your journey to IPO and when you need it. 
and she was very thoughtful about how we progressed from, you know, no audit committee, literally, to an audit committee that really is helping the company get ready for hopefully, a, a, in, you know, in a few years, a, a different future. And so they really have to be thinking of the company, what they can do for the company, um, and how they can really help the company get to that next level. And so there's more engagement. Um, and it's and it might seem a little more tactical at times because that's what we need. And that's what the team needs to develop. I'm now getting more question about the 3D printing. Could you talk about the intellectual property around 3D printing? Well, I've got over 300 patents, so I haven't read them all yet, but um, <laughs> it's really important um, to ring fence the technology and to, you know, we actually, this technology, we, um, we started in 2013. We launched the first product in 2015. So we've, we've uh, we, you know, we have, uh, I have an intellectual property, you know, attorney. Um, that's something we feel is very important. So we have one that is, works for, for carbon. Um, and he was there from the beginning, which is really helpful. And, um, and I'm part of, the, the founder I, a couple other people are part of an IT committee that looks at it all, which ones are important, which ones are being challenged, um, what are our competitors doing. It's really a very, you know, this, I, I was new to this industry, right? We didn't do a lot of 3D printing at DuPont, um, but it was really a great way for me to, to continue to get to know the company, get to know the competitors, um, and kind of understand because it, it costs a lot of money intellectual property to not only create but to um, protect and so I think it is a very important part of our strategy. And now there's an alum who writes I currently work in the 3D printing industry what do you suggest for me to focus on in the short term it's hard to keep pushing innovation on companies with limited investment capacity because of the crisis yeah, and um, and our people feel the same way, right? Because you know we have outbound, you know, um, you know, generation and inbound and all that, and, and you know the the guys are sitting there saying nobody wants to talk to us, and um, and so we said, okay, why don't you talk to them about printing face shields? Why don't you talk to them about the other things that we were doing? And it wasn't as much to kind of create a for them. It was how we help them keep their people engaged right down through our production networks. Um, and the interesting thing is in the last two weeks, we've seen an uptick of people who now want to get back to talk about, you know, the things we were talking about two months ago. And so very slowly we're seeing it start to change and start to improve every week in terms of people wanting to think about the future. And, um, and, and you're right, people are, you know, we're concerned as well about people really opening up purse strings and making uh, commitments in this environment for the rest of this year. And, and um, but we're seeing some, we're seeing some movement and I think we just have to keep at it. Um, I think there's, it's, uh, it can be frustrating, but I think being there for them, uh, listening to them, you know, how's it going for you? And um, just being that ear sometimes um, cre helps create that relationship that uh, that can continue post crisis. And do you think there will be consolidation in the three D printing industry? You know, it's, that's an, a really interesting question. I'm not sure I know the answer to it yet. I, you know, you would think when you look classically at how fragmented it is that the answer is yes. But I think it's going to start potentially bifurcating between prototyping and low volume and people that can, um, and, and technology that can do higher volume, um, uh, you know, kind of at speeds and at, at, at scales that, that are relevant. Um, and so it's something we continue to watch and to look at. I mean, we're in plastic, do we, you know, is metals, that's a different side of it. Should they be together? Should they be apart? Um, and right now what we're seeing is a lot of conversations about it, but I haven't seen much, much activity, real activity at this point. And actually related, do you think crises create great opportunities for acquisitions? Have they played out favorably while you were at DuPont or even at Carbon? Yeah, I think that the problem with the crisis is everybody wants to keep their powder dry. They want to maintain their flexibility, not really knowing what the future is going to be. And so, you know, if you have a large war chest, if you're, if you're pretty bold, 
you might do that. We saw a lot of activity after the global financial crisis. It didn't occur in 09. It was really 10 and 11, you know, as people were recovering at very different rates. But nobody, and by the way, nobody believes they're cheap. Nobody believes their present stock price represents their true value. Um, and they want to go back to where their highs were or things like that. So it's, um, you know, I think people like are a little more conservative at this time. Boards are definitely more conservative. You know, in our board meeting in April, the discussion we put forward of, you know, what we thought the plan was for the rest of the year. And all they kept saying is, are you sure it's not going to be a lot worse than that? Are you sure it's not going to be a lot worse than that? And that's their job to really understand where we where we're pegging it. And so I do think there's a lot of conservatism during the crisis itself. And uh, there's someone asking, during, during COVID, being a manufacturing company, especially in California, how are you taking the decision between opening up to get operations back versus shutting down to ensure safety? Yeah, so the first thing we did was shut everything down and we cleaned everything. And then about a week into it, we, we, with the face shields, we could bring up our labs, uh, our advanced development facility and our labs to produce face shields. And so we went out and talked to our technicians. We gave them an option. You're going to get paid anyway, but would you like to come in and produce these face shields? And, you know, in the beginning we had a few and then it built, you know, as, as people saw that we were, people were in masks, they were, we were adhering to the six feet apart. We were, you know, hygiene was important. We were screening them. If you're sick, you can't come in, temperature, things like that. And so we were really focused on their safety. And so we went on for about, I don't know, six, eight weeks under that. So this was, we were talking about maybe 20 people, two shifts kind of thing across you know pretty big facility and just last week san mateo county opened up manufacturing for retail and so since we supply people like riddell people like adidas we could open up a little more and so we probably have now 40 45 people on site again uh we have we have changed everything there's one way in and out of the building there's one way in lots of ways out right from the safety standpoint they have to sign papers about how they feel. They get their temperature taken. They're given a mask. Um, they're given a workspace or a computer that's distant from everyone else. We had to remap out the entire facility to know where we could put people where we can't. Um, we don't think we're going to have a full house there anytime soon. So we're going to take this very, very slow. Um, and because what, what we don't want to do is is have an issue happen and have to have any of our people get impacted by it. So, you know, our people's health is our first concern. And so we're stepwise into this um, very, very carefully adhering very strictly to what the CDC and, you know, the four things you do, hygiene, screening, masks, social distancing, and making sure our people adhere to it. And I have more one that says, uh, how would you suggest, given you were talking about, how would you suggest one to approach someone like you to have as a mentor? To have as a mentor? I think, you know, I think for the most part, mentors need to be inside your industry or inside your company. And I think because they're, that's where they really know what's going on and they can help you. I mean, I, in the past, have tried to mentor people outside um, my company through, a, you know, uh, through another organization. And it was hard. It was really hard because you're only getting one side of the story. And I think for a, for a mentor really needs both sides of the story. They need to see you in, in your natural environment and how you are, and they need to talk to you about that. And I find that the best mentors are, are local or in your, in your network. Um, but, you know, I've had people in DuPont ask me to mentor them who were two, three levels below me. And, um, and that's when we actually – started a, a formalized mentorship program that all the executives had a couple of mentees. Um, and we, we found that to be really, really helpful um, to not to get to know people three layers down in the organization and the top talents and really how we could deploy them better. And a related question, how have you managed the leaders in your organization, plural, uh, who are not receptive to coaching? Or I guess mentoring. <laughs> yeah, um, that's really hard because at some point you either change the people or you change the people. 
right? You, you, you know, like, um, I'll never forget in the early days, the debate used to be, but I got a really high performer, but he treats people really badly. And it's like, okay, then, then how's that a high performer if he's not developing his organization, if he's not bringing people with them, if it's all command and control? And I think people now view much more holism in, in leadership as being important. And it's not, you know, I had to learn early on that it wasn't about people doing things the way I did them. We each are unique in the way we'll approach a problem. But it's the process they use, the engagement, the collaboration, how they treat people, and what the result is. And, you know, and sometimes I might be counseling people to do things a little differently, and they don't, but the outcome is pretty darn good, then, okay, that's fine. But if, if the engagement or the coaching is around, um, people treatment is around, valuing an organization is around developing their people, that's, that's different to me. That's part of a leader's job. And if they can't do it, you've got a decision to make, right, that, um, that you either accept that as part of your culture, right, and or you change the person. You, you literally, you know, find a, find a very respectful way to exit them from the company and move on. You, you're talking a lot about some of the things we always talk about at Kellogg. So let me ask you, how has your approach to leadership and career success been influenced by Kellogg? Oh, I mean, it was huge for me. I mean, I was an engineer. Um, and I started out in sales, technical sales, calling on people like uh, U.S. Steel Gary Works back in the day and, um, and the electromotive division of GM, where the, where the locomotives are made. And, um, and I didn't know a lot about business, but I knew we were pricing. I didn't like the way we were pricing things. I didn't understand it. So instead of arguing um, with the people in my business, I went back to school to learn. And to me, um, it was like I found home at Kellogg, uh, not only working with young, with my, you know, uh, co-students in different industries and people in banks and people in consumer and advertising and, and then, you know, and I'm in, I'm in, in manufacturing and in industrial and learning from them. And, you know, and I, I, I still use examples from some of my professors as, you know, if you can't explain it to me in one page, you can't explain it to me. That was one of my favorites. <laughs> and um, and I, it just, it changed, it changed my perspective on business. I learned a lot. I, it was probably, it was the most valuable experience of education I've had, and I think it, it really helped me write a very different chapter for me. Well, that's wonderful to hear. Uh, we, we have so many more questions, but we are running out of time. So I just want to ask you one more final question, and then I will send you all the rest of the question. I want to, uh, to say, so basically, there's been a lot written about the women head of states leading, be, being very good leaders of their states during this crisis. Do you think there is a particular component of women's leadership that equips them well for leading through this type of crisis? Yeah, you know, I, it's not true 100%, but it's more true than not that many of the, most of the women leaders I know are very empathetic. Um, they listen um, and they use that in order to create the dialogue, to create hope, right, and to create where we're going. And they can be stern and they can be very disciplined and, and make sure that, that things are following along. But I think the ability to engage broadly with a large group of people and to let them know that you've got their back and that you're with them and that you're going to, you know, help guide them through this is a lot more effective than maybe a command and control, I'm in charge, do it my way kind of thing. And I think that, I, you know, it's, whether it's empathy or another word for that, but I think that is very, very powerful as far as, um, as allowing that person, that leader, to be very effective in times of crisis. That's wonderful. Well, Ellen, I cannot thank you enough. We have so many questions, as I'm saying, I'll, I'll send them. But, and, and, and what was amazing to me is that the, 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 the broad range, Right, exactly. From because reflecting your broad career and all part of experience, so thank you so much for all the insight. It's incredibly interesting, and uh, and it's really a testament. You know, I'm I'm glad you you said that Kellogg was an influence because you're a kind of leader that we like uh, to 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 say, oh, she's a Kellogg alumna. 
So thank you so Great. much for taking this time and sharing with us. And, uh, uh, thank you, thank you very much. And we'll have Great, another you. one on June 5, will be the next, uh, uh, the next person uh, from uh, Eva Menezes. Thank you so much, uh, Ellen.